Well, having music in my life, that started very early. I started on Western classical violin when I was three. Like a lot of Korean kids. Right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so uh, then I, alongside that, started playing piano by ear. So I had 15 years of lessons on violin mm. up until I was a sophomore in college. Mm. And But all, all along the way, I was also kind of banging on the piano and rummaging around trying to figure out songs like a Michael Jackson song or whatever I heard on the radio. And uh, I was growing, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. So a lot of that was pretty good. <laughs> I mean, stuff like, uh, you know, Prince, Police. It was an interesting time. Um, and uh, and it was also the beginning of hip hop, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and so I listened to a lot of rock and a lot of pop music, a lot of soul music, and the early days of hip hop, mm. as well as being studying Western classical music, you know. And then jazz, as just being an American, I think, uh, you know, I'd encounter jazz in these different moments through, let's say, Dizzy Gillespie showing up on a children's television show mm -hmm. for um, for a while Dr. Billy Taylor had a guest spot on national TV on this show called Sunday Morning mm -hmm. so he used to have a maybe a couple times a month they'd give him a slot where he'd uh, have a, have guests like the modern jazz quartet or mm -hmm. Milt Hinton or you know like somebody who's uh, upholding or Max Roach mm -hmm. you know someone upholding that legacy mm -hmm. so those were moments I remember um, certainly Whitten Marcellus came to prominence when I was a teenager and that was very um, it had a huge impact across the board I mean people probably don't directly associate me with him mm -hmm. but actually his coming to prominence with his band and I mean it was really a band you know, and seeing the band in action in different contexts. I remember they played at the, I grew up in Rochester, New York. Mm -hmm. I remember they played at the Rochester Jazz Festival in maybe 87. Um, and I also remember that around that time they played on Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, having a guest spot on, you know, national TV. So I don't know, I guess all of that reached me somehow. The other thing was Herbie Hancock was very prominent um, from when I was a kid. You know, mm -hmm. Rocket came out when I was 10 or something like that. And, you know, I remember the song being ubiquitous. I remember the video being one of the first videos on MTV. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it wasn't about him as, I mean, he occupied a different kind of space than the prevailing stuff that was on. MTV, you know? and I remember that performance on the Grammys when they did that piece, and they did that piece live, and all the robots came to life. It was yeah, yeah, like yeah. revolutionary, you know. And then um, my high school, so that was when I was in middle school, you know. And then my high school had a, a jazz ensemble, and you know, I'd just basically been improvising my entire life on the piano, so I didn't really know. Anything about, I mean, I had some, the, I had learned some theory, but I didn't have any foundation in the mm. language of this music. Mm. Um, so I auditioned and I kind of did my imitative, ignorant, <laughs> like I played something that I had heard recorded. High school, right? Yeah, this is when I was, um, I must have been 14, 13 or 14, when I auditioned for this band. Mm. The guy said, um, I think what I was, I had heard McCoy Tyner on Mary McPartland's show. <laughs> and that was my first sort of like, oh, what's, what are they doing? I don't know what this is, but mm. I put, you know, let me try it. And mm. I didn't know what, I didn't have any sense of the order of it. So I was sort of imitating just the surface mm. quality of it. Um, and so I just sort of made my own creation that was 
kind of a just like a nonsense, a sort of like a, you know how um, the way that babies learn to talk is they first babble for a long time. So I was kind of babbling, you know, on the piano. <laughs> uh, I had a sort of babbling version of uh, McCoy Tyner playing mm -hmm. Cottontail by Duke Ellington. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I mean, I went to college. I didn't know what I was going to study. I checked out a lot of different mm. possibilities, including you know, the humanities and stuff. But I came, I was sort of groomed for the sciences, and I was, I, that was what I excelled at in growing up or in high school. Mm. And that just seemed like a, I think, to my family and, you know, the kind of culture that they came from, which mm. was like, upper middle class educated Indian immigrants mm -hmm. who had in particular scientific and technical training. Mm -hmm. And that's what they kind of valued. That's what they thought of as an education. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't obvious that anything else would really work mm -hmm. for me. You know, I just didn't have any other mm -hmm. points of reference. Mm -hmm. um, and so I completed a, my undergraduate in math and physics. And I applied to graduate schools and PhD programs mm -hmm. in physics. That mm -hmm. seemed like the right next thing to do. Mm -hmm. But I was playing the entire time. So, mm -hmm. and I actually in college started composing, leading a band, and mm -hmm. setting up my own gigs around mm -hmm. campus and around town. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I ended up getting into this doctoral program at UC Berkeley mm -hmm. in physics. Right. So that's why I moved to California in '92 mm -hmm. when I was 20. Mm -hmm. And uh, started that program but I also as soon as I got there started playing in town and in, in Oakland in particular mm. which is where I moved to I was suddenly mm. playing with all these elder musicians from Oakland mm. um, people who were from there or people who had settled there mm. um, a lot of you know basically elder African-American musicians uh, and I remember Pharaoh Sanders was living there at the time. So oh, he used to, yeah. <laughs> I, I was playing at this jam session and he used to come around and wow. I played with him like maybe four or five times. Really cool. Yeah. I mean, played, I mm. remember I, one, of the, the, one of the tunes I had to learn on the gig with him was Polka Dots and Moonbeams. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how, how he played. He played great. And the other one was When the Lights Are Low. Mm. And then we played lots of blues where he mm. just he had a way of just activating the entire room mm. with his sound. And it's sort of like when you're in contact with it in that kind of proximity in this club that was maybe the size of this kitchen or I don't know, like maybe a little longer, but we were just all thrown in together, you know. It was very much just a neighborhood mm. spot that had no kind of luster mm. to it or anything. It was just a place where people hung out and they had jam sessions on Sunday nights. Wow. And I lived across the street. Yeah. So they're like, so you brought hey, the that kid. Electric, electric. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Weird about that. So, um, you know, I just, then one thing led to another. And I started getting involved in different musical projects. Mm -hmm. Or getting I, asked, to, getting called to play. So then after a couple of years, I had this change of heart. And I was like, you know, I was doing fine in physics, but I, my heart wasn't there. And my heart, I really felt... Um, mm. activated by music in a way That's... that felt important and necessary and I also started to see a path for myself as an artist a few different things happened to me around the same time mm. in the year 94 to 95 mm. the academic year mm. um, I took a break from I'd already started uh, on a research project in physics and I decided to take a break from it and then I met this guy named David Wessel, who became who was a computer music pioneer, a researcher, and he, he had start, founded the Center for New Music and Audio Technologies at Berkeley. He introduced me to George Lewis, the trombonist and composer, the AACM member, um, who became one of my primary mentors. The other thing that happened in '94 was Steve Coleman 
mm -hmm. came and did an extended visit mm -hmm. in the Bay Area, which mm -hmm. I was a part of. I helped him organize. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was one of these grassroots residencies that he still does to this day, you know. And then after, you know, that he was there for eight or ten weeks or something. Mm. Then after that, he called me to go on the road with him. Just for a quick jaunt to Europe. But it was like, I went to Paris for one, for a couple of gigs, you know. But it was part of a larger festival of projects of his and... It was recorded, released, mm -hmm. and uh, and then he then that would became an ongoing thing where mm -hmm. I ended up working with him for several years from mm -hmm. ninety five to two thousand. <clears throat> so and then you know, around that time I left physics. I was doing more of my music. I recorded my first album in ninety five. Things just started rolling, and at the same time, I found a way. Um, with the help of David Wessel, George Lewis, composer Ollie Wilson, and mm -hmm. a couple other people, we created a different, like basically an individual um, ad hoc interdisciplinary doctoral program for me. Right. So basically it was like an independent study mm -hmm. um, that uh, lasted some years, and um, David Wessel made space for me and he mm -hmm. found some support for me and and uh, so that got me through that tiny stipend and that time and space to think and listen and develop some ideas mm -hmm. while also touring with Steve and mm -hmm. developing my own music and making records. And, <laughs>